I always say, are you getting sunlight in your eyes within an hour of waking up? The original job of the eyes was not to see objects and shapes and colors and recognize faces. The original purpose, the ancient part of the retina was the visual system is amazing, right? And I mean, we have a lot of sensory systems. You know, we smell, we hear, we feel touch, et cetera. Humans are so strongly dependent on vision. But I think when we think about the normal ways in which we rely on vision, seeing objects, avoiding cars, recognizing faces, we miss a lot of the even more or at least equally exciting aspects of visual science. So a couple of things about vision and the brain. First of all, your eyes have on the back of them, most people know this, a, a thin layer of, of cells, of nerve cells, neurons, and those cells are brain. They are central nervous system. So the only part of your brain that's outside your skull or spinal cord is your retinas. So the eyes aren't, you know, are sometimes called the window to the soul. I don't know much about souls because I don't work on them, but I definitely know that the eyes are two pieces of your brain that are outside your skull. And you go, well, wow, that's kind of weird. Why would that be? Well, it turns out that the original job of the eyes was not to see objects and shapes and colors and recognize faces. The, the original purpose, the ancient part of the retina was placed outside of the skull to be able to adjust the overall state of the rest of the nervous system, right? So that, I mean, because my, if, in order to feel touched, I have to be in contact with something. Sound waves can arrive and smells can arrive from a distance. But in humans, the way that we adjust our overall levels of alertness or sleepiness or focus or other states of mind is by our eyes. So the eyes aren't connected to the brain. The eyes are brain. So these two things in the front you know, of my face are two little pieces of my brain that are out in the world trying to figure out what the brain that's inside the skull and the rest of the central nervous system, which of course is inside the spinal cord, should do, how alert they should be, what they should pay attention to and all that other stuff. So fundamentally, the eyes are the brain. Mm. And then you say, well, how, do, how does this work? How do these little two pieces of brain adjust the state of the rest of the brain? And so the main way they do that is by paying attention to how bright it is outside and how dark it is and when. So the earth spins once every 24 hours, we know that. And it's not a con uh, coincidence that every cell in the body from a liver cell to a brain cell to a retinal cell has a clock. All its gene expression programs are on a 24 hour timer. Now, not all the clocks are synchronized, right? Sometimes your liver needs to be more active than another part of your body. Your heart needs to be active 24 hours a day. You, know, you don't want your heart to shut down at night. It might slow, but it, you don't want it to shut down. So there's this concept of the body as like this factory of all these different cells that all start and end some process on a 24-hour cycle. The eyes have neurons that send information down the optic nerves to the central circadian clock right above the roof of your mouth called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus coordinates the activity like the, you know, sort of a factory over, you know, it, overseer coordinates the activity of all the cells in the body. So the liver is active at the right times. The heart is active in particular ways at the right times, the neurons, the brain, et cetera. And the consequence of that is I'm alert during the daytime and I tend to get sleepy about 16 hours after I view that first sunlight. So, in other words, the eyes are pieces of brain that were designed to detect sunlight because that's what cues when it's daytime and the brain should be active and alert and metabolic process should be going one way and when nighttime is happening. And so we're a series of timers and the eyes are fundamentally important for that timing. Now, the next sort of layer of sophistication in this visual system is related to very subconscious or purely subconscious things like as I walk through an environment and I experience optic flow, things passing by me, I don't even have to be conscious of those things. But as they flow past me, it signals to the other parts of my brain that I'm moving and therefore it triggers the balance system to how to keep my balance. It actually, and we could talk about this a little bit more later, it sig sends signals to the emotional centers of the brain to quiet down anxiety so when we're in forward motion, it actually quiets the fear and anxiety circuits. There's a well, now well-known set of studies, about five studies in the last few years 
in mice and in humans, showing that this optic flow pattern generates a, a subconscious eye movement from side to side, which quiets the amygdala, the threat detection center of the brain. Which is why you've, you've shared before the power of things that we you know, all know well is like, why do we feel so good when we're traveling and we're walking around a new city? Why does it feel so good to take a walk when we're stressed? Because that's built inside of our nervous system. It feels like we're moving forward and it feels like we can handle any kind of threat or stress that we're dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. And this, um, for the listeners that may have heard of EMDR, so eye movement desensitization reprocessing, this is a a therapeutic tool that's used in the clinic to deal with trauma and fear and anxiety where people move their eyes from side to side, which looks kind of goofy if, you know, when you, uh, you know, look at it from the perspective of, well, I'm just sitting still moving my eyes from side to side. That's weird. But that mimics the forward movement of the body and the body doesn't know the difference between whether or not um, you're actually moving through a physical environment by walking or whether or not you're just moving your eyes from side to side. And that underscores the fact that the eyes are the dominant force in driving these states of mind, right? Mm. So the brain, the fear centers of the brain don't actually know about the movement of my limbs. They know about the movement of my eyes. Right. It's and powerful. so, yeah, it's amazing. And, and, and I can't take any credit for EMDR. I, I you know, I think, um, you know, Francine Shapiro discovered that while taking a walk, she was a therapist. She was taking a walk, I think in the woods behind Palo Alto, uh, where she lived at the time and uh, realized that some of her anxiety was reduced by the walk and then, uh, you know, vertical eye movements and keeping her eyes closed didn't have the same effect. And she exported that to the clinic because it's hard to do therapy while people are walking. Um, walking, you know, you can walk side by side, but it's just not very practical for the typical uh, therapeutic setting of Zoom or a, at that time, you know, people met in offices and held therapy sessions. So she, EMDR is anchored in this, in this idea. And then you get into the ways in which the eyes and vision are important for seeing objects, what direction those objects are moving. And then eventually you got trichromacy, which is uh, most people are, unless they're uh, colorblind, they see colors and this richness of color that conveys a lot of information besides just picking fruit. You know, you always see the textbook examples of how much easier it is to pick out a beautiful red apple compared to the green apples. Actually, a lot of picking out fruit and vegetables is actually by smell. If you look at people in the supermarket, I guess before they had masks on, uh, they would smell things. But color is a very powerful cue for all sorts of um, health metrics. We can recognize when we're not quite, when we're off or not, quite right based on skin, subtle variations in skin tone and things. Um, I, I sheen any, in any case, the eyes are doing a lot and a lot more than, than just vision. Um, actually I'll share a, a brief note about the circadian biology and the sleep, uh, wake stuff. Um, there's a, there's a guy, um, a really impressive human being. Uh, everyone should check him out. I've never met him in person, but there's a guy named Dan Mancina, um, who's a professional skateboarder who is blind and um, he has retinitis pigmentosa. And I've known Dan for a little while uh, through conversation. Um, I heard, learned about him, he's very impressive. I just check out his stuff. He's doing incredible, um, incredibly inspirational and, and directly powerful work and advocacy for, for blind populations. Anyway, you know, he and I were in contact because he, um, he was asking about sleep and sleep issues. You know, a lot of people who are blind have issues with sleep because if they're lacking, if they've had their eyes removed or replaced uh, for whatever reason, um, or if they're lacking all the cells in the retina, including the cells that, that signal time of day, they have sleep issues. And, but it turns out that for some people who are, uh, can't see, they're pa completely pattern blind, they can still, at a subconscious level, the retina can still perceive light coming in and can signal these circadian clocks. And so Chuck Zeisler's lab at Harvard Medical School showed that some, not all blind people, can improve their quality and depth and timing of sleep by viewing light, even though they can't see that light. And so you and I, the same thing happens for you and I. I mentioned Dan because, um, you know, he and I are in conversations about how to get some of this information out to the, um, the what they call the low vision community or people who are blind. But in any event, um, I think that uh, most people don't realize that these two little pieces of brain that we call the eyes and retina that are outside our skull are controlling a tremendous number of aspects of our life. So optic flow is powerful, getting into self-generated optic flow each day, walking or running or biking. Um, driving doesn't quite have the same effect, 
but it might, you know, or motorcycle riding, probably dangerous for other reasons. Probably don't want to do that because we could have a discussion about spinal cord injury, but, um, uh, but getting morning light is just absolutely powerful. And then of course, nowadays people are walking, looking at their phone or they're really glued to their, the screen of their phone while they're out walking or even exercising sometimes. And then what you do is what, when you do that is you short circuit the process of, of relieving the anxiety that occurs with an optic flow. So, you know, because the eyes are fixated, they're not moving from side to side. And then you ask, well, people have all these sleep issues. You know, there's a lot of depression and sleep issues and those could be caused by a number of things. But my friend Samer Hattar's lab at National Institutes of Health and also David Burson at uh, Brown University have shown that the light that comes from the phone in the middle of the night from about 11 p.m. to 4 a.m., suppresses dopamine release through a pathway involving a brain structure called the habenula and can lead to memory defects. So now you start piecing together the, the, you know, these things that we see in society, like, oh, when I take a run, I feel better. Or, you know, I'm just exhausted and kind of stressed. And, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night and look at my phone. You can start tacking the vision science to these things that we know are problematic. And what's so cool is that the solutions lie in that, in establishing those connections. When you start realizing what, what's happening, you can relieve a lot of sleep issues. This is why Dan and I got into that conversation about what he might or might not be doing in terms of visual behavior or people who are waking up in the middle of the night and they're trying to get back to sleep by looking at their phone. And even though it's got that nighttime setting, they're actively promoting a depressive state to kick in about a day later. And so, you know, there's a lot of links that I think are starting to um, establish themselves because of, in, in part because of social media, there's this convergence of information on podcasts and social media. And science is, you know, at least I'm trying to butt my head into that. And Sachin Panda has been contributing a lot, a former colleague of mine from the Salk Institute, Sam Hattar is now on social media. And so these neuroscientists are starting to raise their hands and say, hey, I think I might know what's going on here. And maybe there's something we could do right now in order to alleviate these issues. Uh, so, I mean, there's a few things to say on, uh, on that side. Um, Interestingly enough, we have uh, Eric uh, Weinmer coming on the podcast, who was the first blind person to climb Mount Everest. And uh, he, uh, he has an organization. I know he's talked a, a little bit about some of these stuff, but you know, he doesn't have the neuroscience piece. It'd be great to uh, in, in get him involved in that conversation. But uh, going back to it, it's, you know, I, I often think about you know, one of my favorite uh, spiritual thinkers, philosophers is Eckhart Tolle. And he talks about this idea that it's in the nature of humanity to have had something and we take it for granted. It's just built into our nature, right? We grow up on the plains, we're out in the jungle, we're out in the woods. We don't have to think about having better sleep. It's just sort of baked into our life. It's there. But then we lose this thing. We lose it because of technology. We lose it because of advancements, which have brought a really you know, beautiful things to our life. And then on the other end of it, after we've lost it, we have this yearning to figure out why has it been lost and what can we do to bring it back? We find it, but we find it at a deeper level. We find it at a mm -hmm. deeper level that helps us understand that we don't have to take it for granted anymore. And I really think of your work through that lens. It's not, these are, somebody would listen to them and say, wow, that like really makes sense. But it's a whole other aspect to connect the pieces of science together or to do the studies and really show people that this thing that seems very innocent using your night at using your phone at night can have all sorts of cascading implications the next day when it comes to your sleep. And by the way, you know, you, you touched on it, but not directly. It's a lot deeper than just the blue light conversation. Right? Can you expand on that a little bit? You know, a lot of people here have heard about blue light and the importance of minimizing blue light, but it's it's not just about blue light. Yeah. So you know what? Um, it's right because by mentioning social media at the beginning, we I've kind of cued my brain to it. But you know, there are a lot of crazy ideas in the world of biohacking. There's just some downright crazy and some dangerous ideas. And at the same time, there's some really great prompts from the field of biohacking. And one of them is this whole issue of the color of light. Okay. And I'm, um, I'm always reluctant to get into this cause I feel like I'm a, it, it's got sooner or later, I'm going to end up in a, you know, a head to head combat with somebody who's really into like red light therapy or something. And, and my response is always, um, look, you know, double blind peer reviewed literature is important. It's not everything because, you know, oftentimes these more esoteric practices or things where there hasn't been a lot of published research, um, they're just not there yet. 
right? I mean, my lab studies respiration that was prompted by a lot of work that people are doing like Oxygen Advantage, Brian McKenzie, Patrick McEwen, Wim Hof, like Tumo breathers, you know, they can, they can highlight certain things that science might want to take a closer look at. Now, when it comes to the blue light issue, this is especially salient. So here's, here's the idea. So the light, getting bright light in the middle of the night from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. triggers these pro-depressive circuits through the habenula, this H-A-B-E-N-U-L-A, this um, interesting structure in the thalamus. In addition to that, it's known to trigger a pathway from the habenula to the pancreas that can start altering some blood sugar rhythms. A lot of people don't know this, but the habenula connects to the pancreas and actually in type two diabetes, and in particular smoking induced type two diabetes, it appears that the habenula pancreas pathway is involved. There's a beautiful paper published in Nature not long ago that illustrates that. Not my work, another group's work. So Blue light in the middle of the night is going to be very effective at triggering these pro-depressive circuits and disrupting the things that you want in a, in a not so good way through the habenula and other pathways. But it turns out that blue light is not the culprit. It's the brightness of the light and the intensity of the light that matters most. You can have a bright white light or a bright red light and still get these negative effects. Now, the reason for that is that early in the day, which is when you want it shortly after waking, even if it's still dark out, but certainly once the sun is up, you want to get some bright light in your eyes, ideally from sunlight early in the day. Here's why. Early in the day, the sensitivity to light for the retina is low, so you need a lot of bright light in the morning in order to stimulate the pathways correctly. As nighttime approaches, and especially when you've been asleep for a few hours, the sensitivity of the retina goes up. So this is something that isn't often discussed, but there's a, there's a circadian rhythm to sensitivity of the retina so that very low levels of light, regardless of color, can trigger these negative effects in the middle of the night, but they wouldn't be sufficient to induce the positive effects during the daytime. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. So what do you do? Well, first of all, I want to be clear that viewing a you know, bathroom light in the middle of the night if you have to go to the bathroom is, is not the end of the world. It's not going to make you depressed. I mean, you just... On a consistent, if you're viewing bright light in the middle of the night on a consistent basis, that's not good, regardless of color. But for people that think that they can get away with just using amber lights or red lights and still be okay, that's probably not true in the, in the wee hours of the morning between you know 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. is kind of a broad um, area there, but a uh, time frame rather. But I think really you know midnight to 3 a.m. you want to avoid bright light. So blue blockers are a big deal now. A lot of everyone's crazy about blue blockers and they will help mitigate some of the effects. But I had Samer Hatar, head of the chronobiology unit, National Institutes of Health, on my Instagram. We did an Instagram live and he thinks that most of the effects of the blue blockers are just filtering out brightness of light. And he actually has concerns about doing very narrow band or narrow wavelength filtering of light. That's a very unusual situation for the visual system to be in to take out one band of light for significant portions of the day. Um, so am I anti blue blocker? No. You know, I always worry like, are the blue blockanistas going to come after me? Okay, maybe. <laughs> um, we can have a discussion. Um, I think they can help, but I, it's really not about blue light. Now, as long as we're talking about the color of light, it always comes up, well, what do you think about these bright light um, things in the morning to get really bright red light. Typically, it's a sheet of red lights. Again, I don't think it has anything to do with the red light. I think it has to do with the brightness. And then I usually get attacked by the mitochondrial folks and they go, yeah, but what about the effects of red light on mitochondria? And I go, okay, that's a separate conversation. So I want to be really clear that what I'm discussing here is the brightness of light is the key parameter. Avoid bright lights in the middle of the night. Get bright light early in the day, ideally from sunlight. So really bright during the day, cave-like at night is ideal. No one's perfect, so, but think of that as your perfect diet. No one's perfect with their diet either as far as I know. So, you know, play around that, that kind of perfect scenario and do the best that you can. And if on, you a, work, on, a, yeah. on a practical level, when you're winding down at night, right? You're talking about 11, 12. You know, I usually go to bed around, like, let's say 1030, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 1030, 11. So, as I'm starting to wind down for bed and start to think around nine o'clock, are there things that you do on a practical level in your own home that start to help that process? Definitely. So one of the things you can do is to make whatever lights you have in your environment low in the physical environment, meaning not overhead lights. The reason is, is that the retinal cells called melanopsin or intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells that pay attention to 
the kinds of cues that reset your circadian rhythm and can alter your circadian rhythm are in the lower half of your eye. And so they view the upper visual field. They were designed to look at the sky. So overhead lights are going to more strongly stimulate your circadian system and these whole, all these systems than lights that are set on tables or that are lamps that are about head height in the room. And it's not a subtle effect. It's actually quite a large effect. And actually, you can use that to your advantage early in the day. Early in the day, let's say you wake up before the sun rise and you want to wake up or you have seasonal depression and you want to get more light in order to feel happier in the uh, winter months especially if you live at, you know, in you know, Scandinavia or someplace very far north, you want to turn on a lot of overhead lights. And as nighttime approaches, you want to shut off overhead lights and use dimmer lights that are set lower in the room. They don't have to be floor lights. It doesn't have to be like airplane or, or movie theater style, though that would be cool if you could do that in your home. Maybe someone will do that. Maybe Gren Ben Greenfield probably does that. Uh, <laughs> he's like kind of taking it biohacking to the extreme. And, and, and again, I tip my hat to him because it's kind of cool to see what people are willing to do and how far they're willing to push this stuff. But short of putting floor lights in for the nighttime and overhead lights for the daytime in your home, um, you can set desk lamps and dim amber light tends to be softest, the softer lights. And uh, di so dim amber light is great. Candlelight is fine. Thank goodness. Fireplace fine. Thank goodness. There's a beautiful study that was done by a group at the university of Colorado that took graduate students camping, but what's, um, so this would be cool to be a subject in this experiment. What they, and they published this in Current Biology. So peer-reviewed, really, really strong paper. Um, they published several of these, actually. And what's cool is they looked at students who have been studying a lot on tablets and laptops and been on their phones, and they have very disrupted cortisol rhythms and melatonin rhythms. You want cortisol higher in the morning, and then it tapers off as the evening comes around, and then melatonin comes up usually about 16 hours after you got that morning light, uh, your brightest light of the day. So melatonin that makes you sleepy, helps you fall asleep. This is endogenous melatonin, not supplemented melatonin. These students had really disrupted cortisol melatonin rhythms. I think they had been studying for exams. So they took them camping and away from devices and let them just use flashlights and campfire and that kind of thing for a weekend. And it completely reset their cortisol and their melatonin rhythms to the correct healthy pattern. And that lasted quite a while. So mm. I want to emphasize that, you know, one night of a messed up sleep where you turn on the lights, you have to, you know, God forbid, drive to the hospital or something like that. It's not going to screw you up long term. It's the consistent light viewing in the middle of the night and the consistent light viewing early in the day that sets you up for poor and great, uh, you know, feeling and, and well-being respectively. So it's your average behavior, just like diet just like nutrition. It's the average. You know, if I eat a, you know, something really sugary, is it going to completely dismantle my health? No, because, you know, I'm not diabetic and the chances are it's not going to disrupt me much. But if I do it on a consistent basis, it's going to start to dismantle my health. So, uh, but if I could just interject the one thing that was, that was quite uh, inspiring by that study, you know, and obviously it's just one study and it's with a group of college students that are there, but it, it's inspiring to know that just one weekend of going out and camping could be part of that reset process. So for anybody who feels like that is me as they're listening to you and they're thinking about the overhead light in their bathroom or they're thinking about the overhead light that's there or the constant sort of work exposure or computer exposure that they've had and built up bad habits to that process, it could even be that maybe try going for a weekend of camping and seeing how that feels and how you respond to that. Yeah, it's interesting when people have sleep issues, the first thing I say is not, you know, are you drinking caffeine late in the day? Are you keeping the room cool at night? That stuff, sure, that's important. You don't want to drink coffee at 8 p.m. and expect to sleep well, unless, you know, that some people can do that, but most people can't. But I always say, are you getting sunlight in your eyes within an hour of waking up? And people always think I mean you have to watch the sun rise across the horizon. I don't do that. But it's low. So the cells in your eye that, that send all these good signals during the day are looking for what's called low solar angle. So they're looking for when the sun is low relative to the horizon, but it doesn't have to just be crossing the horizon. Usually they say no. And I said, do you see sunlight before you see your phone before screen light? And usually they say no. And so I say, well, just try and get two to 10 minutes of sunlight. And they say, well, it's cloudy where I live. I don't live in sunny California like you do. There are so many photons coming through cloud cover 
it's amazing, far more than are coming from one of these in indoor lights. So then people say, wait, but you said indoor lights are bad for me, but they're not even bright enough to stimulate my clock. But remember, during the day, the sensitivity of your eye is low. You need a lot of bright light. And at night, the sensitivity of your eye is high, which means it doesn't take much bright light from an artificial source. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to get geeky about this for the biohacker types out there, there's a free app. I have no relationship to them, but um, never met them, don't know who they are. But um, it's called uh, like the Lux app or, Lux. Um, or, and it's a Lux meter. And so L-U-X. And so you can go outside on a cloudy day and you can point it to the sky and it'll show you even on a really overcast day, even in Seattle, unless you're in the depth of winter, there are more photons coming through than there would be for a really bright indoor light. And so in the morning, you might need some artificial sources to supplement that bright light or the outdoor light rather. If you live in you know, Seattle in the depths of winter or Sweden in the depths of winter, but really what you need to do is get outside and get some natural light in your eyes within the first hour of waking. And that sets your sleep timer. And most people find that that one shift can really help. And then of course, stay off lights in the middle of the night. There's one other little tip that I think can be helpful. Nobody's perfect. And a lot of us, including me, wake up in the middle of the night, use the restroom, maybe peer at our phone. Uh, Samer Hattar, who is this guy I mentioned who runs the chronobiology unit. Uh, we've traveled a lot together because we're good friends. And we've gone to conferences. And he's always looking at his phone in the middle of the night like, putting it away, like trying not to look at it. I'm like, Samer, it doesn't work that way. And he goes, oh, I know, I know, I know. And so, you know, we know this stuff and we screw up too, right? It's like <laughs> nobody's immune to that. But what you can do is if you can see a little bit of sunlight in the evening when low solar angle is happening because the sun is setting, remember, you don't have to look directly at the sun. It doesn't have to beam you in the eyes, but getting outside and getting those photons reflecting off surfaces and maybe even a, some direct light if you're lucky, like a sunset, it offsets the negative effects of light in the middle of the night. And that mm. effect is quite long. This is a beautiful paper uh, that was published in Scientific Reports that shows that it protects you against some of the negative effects of artificial light in the middle of the night. Anyway, um, if you I do two, three of those things on a regular basis, just like if you, you know, follow a relatively healthy diet, that means different things to different people. But since, you know, everyone's got their concept of what that is, if you do most of the right things most of the time, you're going to do far better on sleep, wakefulness, mood, immune system, metabolism, blood sugar regulation, focus. I mean, it's a, it's a foundational layer of health. And I wish we heard more about it out there, but there's so much science to support it now. And it's very easy. And it's all cost-free if you think about it. There's not a single item that you need. And that's the beauty of, of you coming on and talking about this. And I've heard you in other interviews talk about it to, to the extent that people have said, what's the one thing that you would do or recommend? And you've shared that getting light in the morning is the one thing that I'd recommend for people for the health. Because often sometimes it's, it's in the nature of sometimes very brilliant people that we've had on the podcast and functional medicine doctors who naturally know a lot and work with very complicated patients who have a lot going on. And it can feel like we have to do all these components. We have to make sure that caffeine doesn't happen at this time. We have to make sure that we don't eat late. We have to make sure this. And then for somebody who's just getting started out, they may feel, or sometimes people have done all those and feel like they can't maintain the habits, the habits of those successfully. I do think it's important to talk about prioritization and the prioritization of something that they could try that's available to them that has cascading effects throughout the day so that we can get the biggest bang that's there. You know, the goal is we study all this information for most of us here who didn't go to school for this, don't have a degree for this, which is me and most of my audience that's listening. We study it so that we don't have to think about it later on, so that we can have our health to give love and attention to all the things that we care about in life, which means volunteering for our local church or community or whatever it might be, or giving back or raising awareness about a subject that's there. So knowing where to put that priority and to try it to see if it can work for us, I do think is a great distinction. I appreciate you bringing that up. Sure. No, no, you, you're making an excellent point. Like what are the few things that are really going to move the needle? And I think morning light is that thing when it comes to nervous system function and health overall, you know, uh, you know, we've heard so many things about, you know, people should be doing crossword puzzles and, you know, things and, you know, keep their memory into, into old age. And these light behaviors are foundational. They set the stage for everything else. Um, try and really try hard to get that two to 10 minutes of light outside. Ideally do it walking because that would be even better. You get a little bit of optic flow. People who work shift work and work nights. This is an interesting one. You know, 
the three recommendations I can make really quickly, and then it's probably a whole other discussion on shift work, but try and stay on the same schedule for two weeks or more at a time. These systems get really disrupted when you're nocturnal, then you're diurnal, you're up in the day, you're working the day, then you're sleeping at night. If you're working the night shift, still try and see the sunrise or get some light in your eyes in the morning and in the evening. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to give your biology, all these cells in your body, you're trying to anchor them to something consistent. And what's the most consistent thing in the universe, at least from the perspective of a human, is this 24-hour spin of the earth. Meal timing, some people find, you know, you can anchor to meal timing, trying to keep meal timing consistent. But that gets hard, especially if you have kids, demanding schedule, whatever it is, meal timing can, can get tricky. So it's light is the primary timekeeper for all the cells in your body. And when I say all the cells, I mean even the gene expression patterns are regulated by these circadian clock genes. And so the, see the morning light, see the evening light. If you have a weird, really wonky schedule, people always say, should I wake up just to see the sunrise or the sunlight? Probably. I mean, provided you can go back to sleep, you want to give your brain and your nervous system as many cues as, as they can. So it's sort of like, um, I'm not... I don't personally do intermittent fasting, but I don't eat while I'm sleeping and I don't eat early when I wake up because I'm just not hungry. It's sort of like in the world of nutrition, there's a lot of argument about what macronutrient ratios are ideal for, you know, carnivore, vegan, balanced, whatever. There's a lot of discussion about this outside my wheelhouse. But what I think is interesting about the concept of time, circadian time eating or intermittent fasting, it's sometimes called, is that it's, it sort of anchors things around a few core behaviors, and then a lot of other things stem from it. And I look at light viewing in the morning as equivalent to that. It sets the stage for a lot of other things to work correctly, and it cues your attention, but it doesn't overwhelm your attention. So like you said, you can focus on the other things you need to do. You're not biohacking all day long and all night, just trying to get everything right, because then it's just, you don't want a life where you're just trying to tune yourself all the time. You want to use this body and mind to go do something powerful in the world. If you're a professional biohacker and that's what you get paid for, you're, you're the exception, not the rule. For the rest of us, we want to feel great, be healthy, and know we're doing the right things without having to invest a ton of time and money and energy into it. And light viewing is that thing. And I think it's, it's powerful that when you can come and you can summarize the science that's there, then it starts to feel like, wow, this thing that's so basic, cost-free, that any of us have access to is so foundational let me not take it for granted just because it's not a 90 day program or uh, requires a device or something else that's out there. And I think to get that, we need that explanation. We need that understanding. So thank you again for providing that, you know, so much of what you've been talking about around vision and, and laying the foundation and understanding between vision and the brain is really about giving credit to the nervous system. And I've heard you in, in some of your videos and other uh, podcasts you've done that we know a little bit about the, the nervous system, but at a time right now where everybody's talking about the immune system, we don't give the nervous system as much credit for the role that it plays in so many different functions inside of the body. So just like you did with vision, help us understand some of the foundational aspects that would take us deeper into this rabbit hole that we understand of the nervous system and just how powerful it is with, with all aspects of our, uh, of our existence. Yeah. So the nervous system is the system in your body that organizes all the other organs. So there is no heartbeat without the nervous system and believe it or not, there's no activation of your immune system without the nervous system. Uh, I'll just use that as an opportunity that maybe we can go into it in more depth in a couple minutes. But if you ever had the experience of being you know, very, very busy, working really hard, taking care of somebody else or just or studying or working hard and, and then you stop and you finally rest and then you get sick. Mm -hmm. That's because when your nervous system is activated and is in a mode of stress, it stimulates the, the immune system to liberate cells that, that gobble up immune invader, you know, bacteria and viral particles. And, and so in other words, stress actually enhances the effect of the, of the immune system. Everyone gets this backwards because we've heard that chronic stress can deplete the immune system. And that's true. But in the short term, weeks to months, and that's actually short term for the nervous system and for the immune system, being in this heightened state of stress is going to protect you uh, at some level because it's through nerve cells, nerve connections to the immune, the organs that make these immune cells, the you know, spleen and thymus and others, 
even the marrow of your bones, it stimulates them to say, "What? this is a time of stress. I need, I need defenses up. I can't be asleep at the wheel here. So that's one example of how the nervous system triggers the activation of the immune system. Should you seek stress? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you're chronically stressed, you also want to have some tools to lower your stress. So just like heart rate variability is good. You don't want your heart rate high or low all the time. We now know this. You don't want your stress level to be high or low all the time. You want it going up and down. So if you get these bouts of stress every once in a while, you can say, oh, well, maybe, you know, that's going to help me a little bit. In fact, if you look at intense breathing protocols, tumo breathing or, you know, super oxygenation breathing that looks like, you know, doing that for short rounds of 25 or 30 breaths has been shown to enhance immune system function in the short term, actually can protect against certain forms of bacterial injections where control groups got fever and were vomiting and the people who did the breathing were protected. They were asymptomatic. It's amazing. And this is published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by a legitimate group. This is, you know, real stuff. Same thing with like the cold showers and the ice baths. Some people like them, some people don't. But that hormesis or the idea that small amounts of stress can protect you, that's all mediated by the nervous system's effect on the immune system. Okay, so then you say, well, what other things is the nervous system doing? Well, the nervous system's main role is to establish an internal state of alertness, of immunity, of digestion, and match that to what's happening in the outside world. So we're able to sense odors that come in from a distance. They don't have to, they're, you know, we don't put those smells up our nose. You're not putting rose petals up your nose. You're smelling them at a distance because they're what we call volatile molecules that come in. I can see things because photons of light are bouncing off things. Like sound waves are radiating in. Touch is different because it has to come into contact. Taste is different because it has to come into contact. But the nervous system is taking all that information, all those sensations, and creating perceptions. So we've got sensation perception, which is which of those sensations I'm paying attention to. So if I say, you know, how do the bottoms of your feet feel right now? What are they in contact with? You'll think about that. But a moment ago, I doubt you were thinking about that. Most likely no. So the sensation was happening nonetheless. Your feet were experiencing that, but you shifted your attention to it. So your perception is now about that touch perception. So you've got this spotlight of attention that moves around and leads your perception. And what's cool about that spotlight of attention is it can dilate and it can contract. So I can focus on the pain in my shoulder or I can dilate my attention to what's going on on the planet Earth right now, 2020. So it's kind of interesting, you know, that the nervous system can dilate and contract. That's a very powerful feature of it. Sensation, perception, then we have these emotions, which largely are the reflection of how well our internal state is matched to our external environment. So let's say you and I get off the subway in New York, we're gonna go to a conference and I'm exhausted because I flew in the all-nighter you know, over, you know, and you got there a couple of days earlier and you're like, oh, let's go, go, go. And I'm just dragging. I'm going to feel not well and kind of low because I'm not matched to my environment. If I was back in my hotel and I was just relaxing. I'd probably be pretty happy because I'm tired, but it's appropriate for my environment. So the nervous system and what we call moods and feelings are embedded in that context. So we got sensations, perceptions, feelings, and then we have thoughts and thoughts are a little bit vague, but thoughts should probably be thought of, or should we, we should conceptualize them rather more like actions. I can pick up a coffee mug and drink from it. A thought, they spontaneously happen all the time. I'm not really controlling them. But if I want to have a thought, for instance, I can say, I'm going to think about, uh, I don't know, um, that I don't know what the capital of uh, Zimbabwe is. Like I don't know. And so I can just, I can introduce a thought. So thoughts are happening all the time, but they can be deliberately introduced as well. And then we have actions. And the nervous system is designed to organize our behavior, which of course can be voluntary or involuntary. Most of the time it's involuntary, we're walking around, walking around, walking around. So to just sort of put two other points on this. So sensation, perception, feeling, thought, and action. The nervous system is controlling immunity. It's controlling the heartbeat. It's controlling the breathing. Some of that stuff is voluntary and some of it is not. So let's just think about which stuff is and which isn't. The brain is really good at learning stuff during childhood and then passing that stuff off to the circuits in the body and brain. I, what I mean by circuits are connections between nerve cells and organs to make it reflexive. So I get up and walk to the kitchen to get a glass of water. I don't have to think about it too much. The things that we don't know much about, I call 
duration, path, and outcome events. So the brain has to work very hard sometimes to figure out duration, path, and outcome of things that we don't understand. So COVID-19, what is going on here? What is this thing? Where did it come from? When's it going to, how long is it going to last? Do we need masks? When's there a vaccine? Does it matter? All these kinds of conversations are absorbing a lot of our attention because the reflexive stuff is very easy for the brain. Once a kid learns how to walk, it's easy. You just walk. Unless you, you know, suffer a spinal cord, you just walk. Once you know how to eat, you just eat. But a baby learning how to eat spaghetti is a you know, hilarious thing, like you know, stuff all over their face. So when we are presented with something that we don't understand, but that we need to navigate, the, the attentional mechanisms to the brain shift to a very narrow sphere of attention, and it becomes all about duration, path, and outcome. And that's the other mode that the brain goes into. And that's the strain and mental effort that you have to put into learning something or listening to somebody, especially when they're telling you something that's kind of unpleasant. That's the effort that goes into learning a new physical skill. It's the effort that goes into trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life or you're going to do with a relationship or you're going to, why you're not feeling well, what should you do or why you're feeling great? What, what led to that? So uh, duration, path and outcome is work and it's accompanied by a sensation of agitation and sometimes frustration in the body because it involves signals from the brain to the body to prep yourself for things and get ready. It's a kind of readiness. And so the reason I mentioned this in, in response to your question, what does the nervous system do, is when we are not certain of duration, path, and outcome of an event, either in our media environment or the long scale environment, like how's 2020 gonna end? Who's gonna win the election? I don't know, you don't know, but we can start to analyze the, the various components. When we do that, it creates a sense in our body that something's different, something's changed. And a lot of people confuse that for stress, agitation, and um, pain, when actually it's just your brain trying to learn. The learning process involves an uptick in molecules like norepinephrine, which is also equivalent to, it's, it is adrenaline, which makes you feel kind of agitated and like, something's going to happen. And, and that's why it's hard to sometimes focus. So I mention this because I think that our brain is really good at being reflexive, at least once we've learned things. And when it's in non-reflexive mode, it's supposed to be hard to focus. It's supposed to be hard to maintain active energy toward a process. People, I think that I hear this all the time. I've got ADD. I've got ADHD. People say this about themselves and they may have clinically diagnosed ADD, ADHD, but a lot of people don't understand that the learning process itself is supposed to feel a little not good until you actually get it because it's, that's the way that your system is signaling that something is different and that your brain needs to work differently. And so I offer that to people because I think a lot of people are like, I don't, my memory's not very good, or I think I'm forgetting things. Do I have dementia? Maybe, but more than likely, in most cases, people are just not informed because no one's told them that their brain and their nervous system is trying to get them into action to go figure things out. And they're wondering why it, it feels so terrible, but confusion, agitation, stress, frustration, those are the beautiful mechanisms in the brain that prompt you to learn. You're learning. Which, which you talk about, even as you get older, it, it is more difficult, right? Like it could, like not the same way that you're a child and you just absorb things. You kind of have to work on it because in a way, your mind has gotten good at skiing down certain slopes and you want it to understand something new. So it's going to take a different level of concentration. It's going to take a different level of energy to try to bring in a new, diff a new thought. Now, once you step into that and you understand the role of neuroplasticity and how to take advantage of it, you can do other things to, uh, I've heard you in other uh, interviews and, and on the Instagram videos you've talked about, you can do things like how can you hack the process of learning so that it's actually one, you look forward to the fact you, you're not surprised at the fact that it's not, that it's a little uncomfortable, right? So that's the first thing is that you're not surprised so that when it happens, you don't feel like uh, discombobulated. And the second aspect is how can you actually create little releases of dopamine along the way for the learning process so that you can lean into it and actually starts to feel better through that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we've got neuroplasticity on the one hand, and then we've got growth mindset on the other. 
And what we're going to do now is we're going to merge them and put some neuroscience concepts to, to provide the glue between them. So growth mindset is obviously not my discovery. This is the discovery of Carol Dweck, my colleague in the psychology department, who found that there's a subset of kids that really enjoy doing math problems they knew they couldn't solve. They could not, they were fail, they were sure fail math problems. So these kids get very good at math, even though they can't solve these problems, because for them, the pleasure, the dopamine release is from trying to figure it out. They, these are the same people who love puzzles and they get a thrill from the process of being confused and trying to work through the puzzle, you know, fitting the puzzle pieces in that process. So it's also the concept that our brain is not fixed and that at the moment my brain, that it works one way, but that I could through effort get it to be work better at something, some task, some motor performance, whatever it is you want to learn. Neuroplasticity during childhood is very robust. The whole chemical milieu of the brain is established to allow our environment and our experience to just passively wire our brain so that it is customized to the habitat and the experiences that we are in as a child. As we transition to adulthood, meaning about age 25 onward, the physical connections between neurons, those synapses, actually get cemented into place by extracellular matrix. They're things like chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans and perineuronal nets and, you know, for the aficionados out there, there's a lot of cool stuff that's expressed around neurons that make sure that they don't move around too much. In order to get plasticity in adulthood, you need a chemical signal to come in and say, change these synapses. And it has to be very localized. And that chemical signal can be dopamine, but most often it's acetylcholine. And acetylcholine comes from two major sources in the brain, brainstem and nucleus basalis, which is in the basal forebrain. And it's released when we pay very close attention to something and it marks, it's like highlighter pen that marks the synapses that then 24 or 48 hours later will be strengthened and that strengthening is the learning process. In other words, if we wanna learn as adults, we have to be very alert and we have to at least be very focused on what we're trying to learn. You cannot learn passively in adulthood. Now there's plasticity in adulthood that's maladaptive. So if I get hit on the head with a brick, there's gonna be plasticity, but that's maladaptive plasticity. So I just wanna be clear, it's passive, it's just gonna happen. I don't have to think about the brick, it's just gonna happen. But adaptive plasticity, or what I call self-directed adaptive plasticity, has to be self-directed. In order to change our brains in adulthood for the better, we, meaning the person that's experiencing the brain change, has to be the one directing that change. I cannot change your brain for the better just by telling you something. You, are, you control the gate to that. And that gate is attention. And so how do we do this? Like, how do you think, how, do we, how should we think about plasticity in adulthood? Well, it means that we should try and learn things by engaging in very short bouts of focused attention. People say, how long? As long as you can maintain focused attention. The good news is the, the circuits for, for focus themselves are amenable to plasticity and you get better at focusing. Now, there are data to support this. So I just want to tip my hat to those data. Eric Knudsen's lab, he's now retired, but in the neurobiology department at Stanford, had a couple decades worth of work showing that adults can learn as well and as much as youngsters, juveniles, if you take the learning and break it up into short bouts. Makes sense, you're chunking, and you can probably maintain focus for short periods of time better than you can long periods of time as an adult. Great, but then he also showed something incredible. He showed that if the learning is the only way that you eat, in other words, it's critical for your survival, you can learn as much as you did in childhood in one bout. Wow. And that tells us something. People say, okay, what am I gonna do? Put a gun to my head? No, please don't. But what that tells us is that there's a neurochemical signature of urgency. That urgency signal converges with the focus signal and reopens plasticity for that thing. So people, you know, there's a vast literature in wellness, you know, should learning and motivation be from a place of fear? Should it be from a place of love? You know what? Neurochemically, it doesn't matter. It just has to feel urgent. Let's say I write you a check or I write a check to an organization that I hate for $10,000 and I give it to you and I say, I'm going to learn conversational French by next week where I want you to send that check off and I want you to publicly acknowledge that I made that that check out to group X that I dislike very much. That's a strong incentive. It's a punishment incentive and I'll work very hard. 
it will work. Or I could say, you know what, I really want to learn conversational French because I'm going to travel to France. It's really important to me. And I'm going to create some reward incentive, not a punishment incentive. Doesn't matter. The point is that I'm going to focus and I'm going to do the work. And people, it's interesting, I, I offer this information on Instagram and people always say, well, what can I take? Like, how do I get more focus? Well, acetylcholine is the source of focus. You could take things that are going to promote acetylcholine release, eat a few more nuts because they have choline, um, maybe take L-carnitine, subtle effects, very subtle and general because it's across the board. Nothing's going to work like to focus like focus. And that's the kind of stinger in this. And people say, well, I have a hard time focusing. Well, but that's where people get confused because the agitation and the fact that your mind is drifting from time to time, everybody experiences that. I, I'm a, good friends with Stephen Kotler and I really appreciate all his work on flow. I think the work from Chiksamahai on flow is really great. But these what I call highly desirable states like flow, they've captured our, our excitement to the point where we think that learning is supposed to be flowy. No. Learning is effort and strain and grinding through and refocusing and refocusing and refocusing. And it's not a linear process. And so you're going to get little glimpses of focus in a focus session. And that's going to trigger plasticity. Now, there's something important, which is the growth mindset. The growth mindset and if, is if really I add, about... If I, if I could clarify one thing that you were saying, it, it's it's also that more of it strengthens that muscle. So we have to think of focus like a muscle, right? So it's the practicing of it. And I've heard you say, well, focus for as long as, it, as you can. And then you take it a little bit further, right? That's the powerful aspect of a deadline. You know, having an interview each week that I have to get prepared for, you have to learn things that you typically wouldn't learn because you have an interview, it's pending, you better ask good questions because if you don't, if you don't understand some of the material, you're gonna look like, you know, like you don't know what's going on. So this is the power of self inflicted deadlines or urgencies that we create in our life or accountability that help us learn things that we typically, if we had all the time in the world and we didn't have to learn it, then we may not learn it in that way that we needed to. Absolutely. And you get, you can get better at these things. And I'll talk about some of the tools. Um, I'm going to do an Instagram series on this, but I'll talk about it here for the first time about what you act. I'll do, I'll talk about some of the things that I do and that are supported by research um, in terms of to enhance focus. I want to just, cause you mentioned dopamine, yeah. you know, there is a, there is a, a second portal through this process. And that's when, you, so the focus and effort regime, effort is mainly norepinephrine and adrenaline in the body, alertness and effort. Acetylcholine is that spotlight of attention. This is why taking things to enhance focus generally increases norepinephrine and uh, caffeine will increase norepinephrine, make you more alert. But, you know, if you're too alert, it's hard to focus. So there's that, you know, thin, think of it like a mountain that has got a, you know, like a shallow climb and then there's a there's a top and then a steep drop off you know if you're too agitated you know and your deadline is too close it actually can be harder to work so sometimes it sharpens you sometimes it distracts you so it's a sweet spot we'll talk about how to kind of get into that and move through those into those sweet spots more more regularly growth mindset is really about attaching the sense of reward to the effort process to learning how to have that low level or maybe even high level of agitation in your body and realizing this is me getting better or I am primed to get better. My nervous system is now ready to engage in neural plasticity. And dopamine is often discussed in terms of reward, you know, a, a getting a degree or, um, you know, finding a life mate or mating itself or, and it is associated with all those things. That's how mother nature wired in these very generic reward mechanisms for many different types of wins, depending on your life goals and circumstances. However, dopamine is also more like a jet engine that gets you to the next goal. It's a read out of whether or not you're on the right track or not. So let's think about an animal that's hungry. So let's just think of some you know, foraging animal, I don't know, a deer or something, and it wakes up from a nap and, it, and it's hungry. It experiences that hunger as agitation, adrenaline. It starts wandering Stress. and looking for food. Stress. Stress of the body. Low level, that's right, low levels at first, but after a couple of days, it's gonna become quite agitated, okay? At some point, it smells something in the distance it's going to get a little pulse of dopamine, which is like, oh, I might be on the right track. And now it makes it to a berry patch and maybe it gets a little bit of sustenance from that before it moves on to another place. So dopamine is secreted along the way to our goals. And sure, big wins, you know, winning the Super Bowl or your candidate wins the election or whatever. Sure, big rush of dopamine. 
But most of what dopamine is responsible for is keeping, helping us stay on track, find the right tracks and stay on those trails. So when you find yourself in effort and strain in the learning process or in a personal development process, maybe you're trying to remap a, tra a trauma, you're going to work through that in whatever way you do. Maybe it's EMDR or trauma release, you're working with a therapist. You should also periodically reward yourself for the fact that you're doing that. If you're in a fitness regime or you're trying to eat better, reward yourself for the fact that you're doing that, you're leaning into the effort process. You can even learn to attach reward to the sense of hunger, knowing that a little bit of hung, hunger for certain periods of the day is probably good for some of the cellular repair mechanisms that lead to longevity, you know, so David Sinclair-ish, um, you know, Sinclairian type uh, thinking and science, which is well supported by science. So, and others, of course. So I think that these reward mechanisms can be attached to anything because A, it's completely cognitive and B, remember, rewards are always internal. You don't actually take money and stuff it in your brain and that triggers the release of dopamine. It's your association to it. So people always challenge this and they say, well, that's just positive self-talk. Ah, but this, what I'm talking about is the opposite of positive self-talk. I'm not talking about saying, you know what? I can barely perform the task that I'm trying to do and that's great, that's terrific. It is not about attaching the sense of reward to the ultimate goal. It's about attaching the sense of reward to the effort process itself that's going to lead you to the goal. And in order to do that, you have to shorten the horizon. You have to bring the horizon in closer and understand why you're engaging in this process at all. And so it's subtle, but it involves not just, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step or how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. It means relishing each bite just enough to get you to the next bite and the next bite. And the which, reason this is could even mean like a little bit of, of gratitude for yourself for the fact that you have accomplished something that was scary. If you've never done Instagram videos like yourself and you're just even opening up the iPhone and posting something small, like congratulating yourself, could that be part of the process? Absolutely. It's, you're, you have to reward yourself for the fact that you're making the effort to get better, even though you might not have gotten better. And in fact, last night I experienced this. I'll just tell you. So this week was interesting. I was on two NIH panels. I was getting up at six in the morning, be on those long Zooms. I was doing a lot of things. I, I ground myself down. And last night I found myself at 1030 at night, just very resentful. Like I'm, I'm exhausted. I've just, this week was, it just wasn't those panels. There's a ton of stuff. I was just we had a family birthday and it went really well, but it was a lot of commuting, a lot of, lot of effort. And I was norepinephrine maxed out, just maxed out. And I started laughing to myself because I thought this is exactly the opportunity. Like I'm doing all the things that I love. I love reviewing grants, frankly. I love writing them. I love reviewing them. I don't know. I'm sicko, but you know, that's what I, I enjoy doing. <laughs> a family event, a 75th birthday in our family. A, the opportunity, I got a couple of good workouts during the week, not as many as I would have liked. I started realizing how lucky I am to be able to lean into all this action. And all of a sudden, I'm good. And it's funny because people underestimate the value of gratitude and reflecting on the effort process. It wasn't that everything went spectacularly well. Some things went better than others. It's that when you reward the effort process, it resets you. Humor resets you because gratitude resets you because it's neurochemical. It's not when people say it's just psycho it's psychological. No, it's actually the release of dopamine, which we know suppresses the noradrenaline circuits and gives you more room to lean back into effort. And, you know, it's... It, the opposite way to go is to compl is still just keep trickling out norepinephrine. I think we've made too much of grit, resilience, and sort of these mindsets of leaning in and effort without thinking about what actually controls the valve on grit and resilience. What has us actually want to intrinsically want to keep on moving forward because it has to feel good. And, and for anybody else that there's just thinks that this is just pos you know, positive psychology, it's like, well, our thoughts are actually things, as you were saying earlier. They're like actual things that are there. They're in our body. There's a chemical process that's happening. It it's, was designed that way for a reason. And if we can understand the role that gratitude has, you know, we had uh, BJ Fogg on the podcast recently from uh, also Stanford, and he's talking about the number one reason why people don't keep up or make something a habit is that they don't reward themselves along the way in addition to all the other components. So just the fact that we are willing to reward ourselves through gratitude, through reflection and saying, you know what, I'm trying something hard. It's difficult, but I'm proud today because I took that step or I did this particular thing. Those things are meaningful and will have us continue is what I'm hearing from you. 
Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, it's hard to suppress thoughts. Don't expect that of yourself. I have negative thoughts. Everyone has negative thoughts, but you can introduce positive thoughts on top of those. And that's the, those stimulate the neurochemical systems that I'm referring to. These are real entities that we're, we're born with. They're in our genome. They're encoded for it. You don't have to learn how to use them really. They're available once you, at any point, once you realize that they're available. And these were designed to evolve our species. These were designed to get that deer food and water. They were designed to get you through a learning process, you through a hard process of any kind. I think that a lot of people, they feel that agitation, strain, and confusion, and it scares them and it freaks them out and they back away from it. And that is the portal to plasticity. And neuroplasticity is mother nature's gift to us that we have that our entire lifespan. It's actually a good thing that we don't have plasticity like we do in childhood throughout the lifespan because we would never actually be able to pass anything off to reflexive behavior. It would be so metabolically demanding that we'd have to spend all our time consuming nutrients we wouldn't actually have evolved our species. So, you know, spending time, you know, tool development and doing other things. So it's very important that people understand focus and then that the actual rewiring occurs during sleep and other forms of rest. So slow wave sleep in particular, not REM sleep, but slow wave sleep in particular is when a lot of the restructuring of the connections in the brain is happening that were triggered by the focus event. So plasticity is a process. You trigger it and then it occurs later. The other times it occurs are in 20 minute naps. This was shown in a recent paper in Cell Reports, beautiful paper in humans learning spatial task. 20 minute naps that are shallow naps enhance the speed and depth of that learning. I'm a big proponent of a practice that some people call yoga nidra, N-I-D-R-A, which involves lying down and just listening to a sort of like a, a relaxation script. I do this for 10 to 30 minutes a day for two reasons. One is it gets you better at relaxing and it makes you a better sleeper, it makes it easier to fall and stay asleep. The other reason is there was a study done at the University of of Copenhagen in Denmark showing that these 10 to 30 minute deep relaxation bouts, which are not meditation, you're not focusing on anything, you're actively unfocusing in fact, they can enhance some of the dopamine in the brain circuits that are useful for action and action planning and learning. And so if I don't sleep well, I'll do a 30 minute yoga nidra first thing when I wake up or sometimes in the afternoon. I find it very restorative. I fundamentally disagree with my colleagues that you can't restore sleep that you missed. I don't know about the sleep, restoring the sleep state, but I know that cognitive function can be enhanced and even restored by these periods of deep rest, which are different than meditation. If you're interested in this, um, that you just uh, put into YouTube, there are a number of apps out there. There are a lot of different scripts. Some people like one voice or another. I happen to like the voice of, um, uh, her last name is Desai, D-E-S-A-I. And there, she has an app as well. But if you go to YouTube and you say Yoga Nidra, Desai, there are a bunch of scripts. Some are 10 minutes, some are 30 minutes. They involve a little bit of the kind of, uh, uh, you know, let's be fair, um, you know, sort of a new agey kind of language around uh, that kind of puts off certain people. But really all it is is deep relaxation. And that has been shown to enhance these neurochemicals, which can enhance the neuroplasticity process. So sleep is always best. But if you can't sleep, sometimes doing these deep relaxation scripts can be almost as good. And is there a time of day for yourself? Is there a time of day that you'll find that you'll want to bring it in? Is it like two o'clock after kind of like a lot of activity and the, you know, what, what time do you bring it in to enhance in your sort of flow? Or do you call upon it when you're finding yourself like, a little stressed out, a little bit sort of pulled in different directions, a little bit like hard to focus. Uh, how do you tap into that toolbox? Yeah, I do five nidras a week, 10 to 30 minutes each. If I haven't slept, as, if I wake up and I don't feel rested, I don't have the luxury, unfortunately, of just going back to sleep most of the time. So I'll do a 30 minute or a 10 minute, one of these deep relaxation scripts. And I swear I wake up, for, I come out of that. Sometimes I fall asleep during it, sometimes I don't, but I come out of that feeling completely ready to go. That's my experience. We've studied this in my lab and people go into very deep states of, of relaxation and brain waves that mimic sleep. Um, if and in the afternoon maybe I'm, I'm feeling groggy, I might do it in the afternoon. And if I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm ruminating and I'm having a hard time turning off my mind and I can't sleep, I will do this instead. 
So it's not a set time each day. It's more that you're calling upon it. If there's a feeling of I'm not feeling as alert or as rested as I would normally feel at my baseline right now. That's right. And there's, I have a friend, um, his name is Ryan Suave, who's doing really incredible work in the trauma uh, and addiction community. He's a trauma therapist and a board certified therapist using Nidra as a component of the treatment for trauma and addiction. And of course there are other components to those treatments, but for people that are interested in trauma release and are working through things, um, I, whether or not it's because of plasticity or restoration of these neurochemicals, um, he's had tremendously positive results. We're actually thinking about running a study um, with an inpatient population that he works with out in Colorado. Um, my lab studied this process. For me, it's also just easier than meditation because meditation involves concentration and I'm spending most of the day trying to concentrate. Um, along those lines about focus, um, a lot of people say like, what are your tools for focus? So I, I'll just mention that the things that I do that you may or may not find useful. Okay, so they, they range from pretty extreme to uh, rather benign. When I was in college, um, no joke, I actually used to chain myself to my chair. We didn't have phones back then. And I would throw the key across the room to the point where I would have to drag my chair across the room in order to mm -hmm. unlock myself. Uh, my goal at that time was to get through large volumes of reading uh, and there was a lot of memorization and I found myself just getting way too distracted and I would try and find the right amount of coffee. Did it didn't make sense to listen to mellow music or like really intense music. And it was so variable that finally what I found was, you know, basically I'm going to just take this to the extreme and just chain myself to the chair. That's a little extreme. I was 19 years old then. I'm not sure I recommend that. And also it's a fire hazard. I guess if you had to get out <laughs> quick. Nowadays, um, I confess that I lock my phone in a gun safe. Um, you know, I, this has nothing to do with firearms. It's just that it has a timer on it. So you can actually time the safe and I just lock it in there and I turn on a program on the internet, a freedom that just shuts down my internet access and I write down anything that I want to look up later. And I will be honest, I hate this process. It is painful. It creates a ton of anxiety. Being away from the phone promotes anxiety. I get it. it um, uh, but what I find is I can accomplish more in a 60 minute bout of no distraction than I can in you know two days of broken work. So that's what I do. A lot of people have asked like, what about diet and supplementation? Um, for me, being a little bit hungry actually helps me focus. But if I'm too hungry, obviously then I'm gonna think about food. I love to eat, I love to eat. So I'll generally capture that mid morning session as a key time and then I eat after that and then and my lab doesn't work on supplementation. I just want to be fair. I always, of course, check with your doctor. I'm not promoting supplementation, but I think there are a few things that can enhance focus for occasional use that are much safer than most of the stuff that people are out there using. You know, people look to stimulant, powerful stimulants. I drink caffeine. So hydration and caffeine work very well to enhance focus. A lot of people overdo the caffeine part, but they don't it, overdo they the get off hydration. That cliff, part. as you were talking about earlier, like where they yeah. get so jittery, they can't focus, and now the caffeine is no longer playing the role that it could play in, in potentially helping them a little bit in the morning. That's right. Four to one volume of water to caffeine is what I actually do, um, and. A lot of people say, well, then you have to go to the bathroom all the time. Well, this is kind of fun because then we can get right back into brain circuits. So there's a, there are several studies that have shown that the reason you wake up in the middle of the night when you have to urinate, when you have to go to the bathroom, is because there's actually a circuit, neurons that connect your bladder to your brainstem and wake up your brain. This is when kids are really young and they, they, these circuits aren't developed. This is why they wet their beds when they're really little. So that circuit wakes you up. And believe it or not, there are communities of first responders although, and people in certain areas doing certain kinds of military work and whatnot that understand that hydration, part of the reason it makes you alert is because of the cellular hydration. We hear 70% or whatever your brain is and body or water. A lot of the alertness that you get from hydration is also because your bladder is full and it stimulates alertness. Wow. Now that I haven't heard before, but that's amazing. But you've experienced <laughs> this, right? If you ever had it, to, yeah. I mean, when someone really has to go to the bathroom, it's, it's downright stressful. It's agitation. Think about so a I'm road not, trip. You're on a road trip. You got to pee. There's not a place that's in sight. You are alert, even if it's later in the evening when you might be a little bit tired from having driven the whole day. 
it can pull you out of deep sleep. So this is, it's weird because it's a very, um, it's not a very uh, elegant tool, but hydration and caffeine can work together. And then there are some supplements like L-tyrosine, which is a dopamine precursor. Those can, uh, for occasional use, can bring about like heightened levels of focus and mood. However, I would caution most people about taking anything too close to the molecule you're trying to create. So for people that want, they're like, oh, I want more serotonin, I'm gonna take 5-HTP. I recommend against that because you start to short circuit your own natural production of 5-HTP. Your body feels serotonin. like it's regularly coming in, so it's not gonna, it, it just like it won't, it, it feels like it's compensating permanently with that item. That's right. Just like people who take testosterone, right? Um, they shut down their own gonadal production. That's well known because the bloodstream, there's so much of it in the bloodstream, they don't need to make their own. So I think with dopamine, it's kind of scary to me. Nowadays, you can go to the health food store, go on Amazon and buy L-DOPA. It's called mecunipurines. And it's basically 99% L-DOPA. That will give you a very strong effect in the short term, but you're going to feel a real crash for a couple of days afterwards because you're going to deplete your dopamine. Things like L-tyrosine are the precursor, the amino acid precursor to dopamine and there are a few steps in between. So the further away you are from the molecule that you're trying to create, the safer you are. Now the furthest away that you can get is behaviors. So the self-reward mechanisms we talked about earlier or some um, you know, timed intermittent fasting to increase adrenaline. Remember that deer that was hungry because it was searching? You know, you're making yourself a little bit hungry which can make, bring about some alertness, not too much hunger that you're so stressed about food that you can't think about your work. You, you know, you're, you're drinking water, so you're getting those signals from, from the bladder to the brainstem, as well as cellular hydration and alertness um, at the brain level. So you can start to create tools that converge. And the beauty of doing that with tools that are very, they're pretty benign tools, right? I mean, none of this is a prescription drug. None of this is a, a you know, really intense practice. Yoga Nidra is 10 to 30 minutes, light viewing in the morning. You can start to see these things sort of start to weave together in kind of what I call a, a neural circuit basis for kind of wellness and performance. Mm. It's based on neural circuits in the brain and in the body. And if you want to get a little more extreme with the behaviors, go for it. You know, I've, there have been times in my life, I haven't done this recently, where I would draw a little cross, cross hatch on a piece of paper, put it up across the room, set a timer, and see how long I could keep my concentration on it. I do allow myself to blink. It's not easy, but you can build up to 10 or 15 minutes and that can immediately transfer to a work bout. And the reason is, is we go back to the eyes, the beginning of our discussion. Your eyes were designed to focus, obviously, your visual world. The lens moves and you can do all these things to focus your visual world. And that brings about a mental focus. A lot of people don't appreciate the extent to which our sensory environment is what we should use to guide our focus. Just sitting there and going... Focus, 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 focus from the inside out doesn't really work so well. It's hard to control your mind with your mind, but you can control your mind with behaviors. You can control your mind with visual input. You can control your body and your mind through these neurochemical systems. And the, the entry points to doing that are vision, sometimes conscious breathing, um, some mindset work like positive rewards and these kinds of things are good. Light, you know, light, smell, touch, these are the ligands, the, the things that attach to receptors in the body that create our states of mind. And you ultimately are in control of those. And so it's been fun and refreshing for me in the last couple of years to spend so much time in the, you know, with folks from the wellness community, because fortunately in 2020, that wellness community is populated, yeah, with a lot of kind of crazy ideas, but also some people like yourself, like Mark, you know, people like Sachin, uh, David Sinclair, other people who, who think about how to integrate the science with these things that for a long time existed purely as psychological concepts or even spiritual concepts. And the spiritual and psychological is beautiful. I think we should tip our hats to that, those communities for, for you know, landing the Eckhart toys, for putting the stuff on the table. Science can point to protocols that most likely are going to give us the biggest effects. That's and, how and, I view. And also with so much focus on access and inclusion, we also need tools that can, can scale, that many people can, can get a chance to do. And there's nothing more uh, basic than our access to light, uh, you know, breathing, the ability to like take rest. These are things that everybody can do that have profound effects that don't require them to reach deep in their pockets to 
pay for things that they may not have access to. And I think that those tools are just so important. And when you look at a lot of people that are out of balance that are trying to address some aspect of their life, it's always that, you know, a good functional medicine doctor or a practitioner will look at them and just start off with the basics. Because as much as we all think that we are practicing the basics, we are very much not because our world and the way that technology interplays with that world is so designed to pull us out of attempting those basics. And if we haven't addressed those basics that are there, looking at light in the morning, thinking about our breathing, and I know you have a lot of thoughts on that. Well, I have to say that for a round two, when we have you back on, we could probably do an entire podcast just on breathing and respiration alone and how that can impor- uh, play a role in focus and so many other aspects, including uh, regulating our nervous system. But all in all, Uh, I guess really what I'm trying to say is that these tools are the foundational things that we can all remember and remind ourselves that play a crucial role with our daily experience of the world. We, We forget sometimes that we weren't here and then the world came. The world was here and our body designed its DNA, its cellular biology, its nervous system around the existing planet that was there. So we are a byproduct of that. We have to live in harmony with it. Yeah, extremely well put. I, I, it's beautiful. I was really enjoying hearing you say that because I, I, in all these years, I really haven't thought about that order of operations, but that's exactly right. The nervous system was shaped on the anvil of the earth, if you will, like in the environment of the earth. And it has these capacities to be customized based on child, specific childhoods and habitats because a big part of the brain is to adapt to whatever it is that it experiences early in life, but has this feature of adult plasticity that you know, is a real thing. Everyone has access to that. Everybody has access to that. There's no person that has hyperplasticity and there, and there are no people that don't have access to plasticity. Everyone has access to plasticity. And sometimes the gates to plasticity, which are, remember their alertness, focus, and then later rest. Some people have an easier time with the alertness and focus part and a harder time with the rest part. Nobody's great at those across the board. Immediately, they take some practice and it's totally doable. Uh, it takes a little bit of, of time commitment. I'm glad that you mentioned inclusion and a low cost or no cost. You know, obviously this is so crucial now um, to scale out and get tools out to people, um, to get everybody. One of the things that I uh, just will, maybe this is an ask, I want, uh, I'll call it what it is, it's an ask. You know, in the scientific community and in laboratories, we have something we call watch one, do one, teach one, where you watch somebody do a procedure, then you do it, usually you do a lot of them, and then you teach it. And, um, you know, I'm delighted the opportunity to be here and to share and on Instagram and to share. I'm so thrilled that there are platforms like this one that you do. Um, But I think that, you know, there are large communities that still don't hear about this kind of stuff, not just the things I'm talking about, but all all of it, and especially what you just mentioned, which was beautiful. And I think it's important that as we try tools and we adapt those tools and into our life and we find what works for us, it's important that we also hand off those tools to people that we care about and to teach as many people as we can. This is one of the reasons why I don't have a bone to pick with named protocols, but one of the reasons I really try and emphasize the physiological and neuroscience principles underneath the stuff like light viewing and what, and I don't call them like, you know, my dog's name is Costello. I don't call them the Costello principles or something is because <laughs> then they become vaulted in something that is further away from the meaning and the, and the sort of underlying mechanism. Of course, a ton of mechanism is confusing too. So I want to just to encourage people to try tools because hearing about them is great, but try them, find what works for you, what doesn't work for you, adapt them and share them. And it's okay to not know all the science behind them. If you want to learn more about the science, by all means, learn it. But I think watch one, do one, teach one could do a lot for wellness and health in society because people largely learn through word of mouth. Mm-hmm. And right now there's, there is deep confusion, understandable confusion about who the experts are. You know, we don't know who to trust nowadays. Mm-hmm. And um, there are a lot of opinions in the room and degrees help, but they're not everything, right? There are a lot of people with degrees who, ha- who look very unhealthy. I've had dentists with very bad teeth. <laughs> I generally don't stay with those dentists. So, you know, uh, there are people who have no degrees who know a tremendous amount. And so I think bringing people together is great, increasing the conversation, but watch one, do one, teach one, or watch one, do many, teach. And um, the, look, Mother Nature, Mother Nature is the path, everything I've talked about today, right? I'm not, I don't need 
anything from this because I didn't invent any of this. Mother Nature built this for us. You know, Mother Nature, God, the universe, whatever your beliefs and leanings are, I support those. The important thing to understand is that the patent doesn't belong to human beings. It, it doesn't even belong to humanity. It was, like you said, we were sculpted on this stuff. And so I think teaching and passing along tools is, is the next big step especially for underprivileged populations, but really for everybody. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. There's an automated system that runs in all life that's embedded in your cells. One of the benefits of fasting there is less chance of diabetes, but you also are nicer to people if you do occasional interactions.